My name is uh, Jason J. Rock Houston, and you're listening to Chaotic Risk Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.chaoticrisk.com. Our special guest tonight is uh, Society One guitarist uh, Maxwell Carlisle. Um, uh, welcome back to the show. Maxwell, how you been doing? Hey, thanks a lot, man. I've been doing really good. It's, uh, it's nice to talk to you again. Now, um, like I said, you're currently um, the guitar player in Society One. Um, you, you've um, joined the band a couple years ago, and I understand you guys are currently um, working on a new album. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right, and uh, I'm real excited about it because this is this will be the first Society One album that I will have a significant uh, contribution to. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. There was one. There was one single that was released earlier last year, uh-huh. and I, you know, I played guitar on that. But obviously, you know, all of the older, you know, like you said, I've only been in the band a couple of years, so all the older material has a, a, a you know, a wide variety of guitar players on it. So yeah, this. You know the full album will, uh, you know, will I'll be able to. Uh, and, well, and, and, actually, we've already recorded a lot of it, so okay. a little bit of it is still uh, it's still in the recording process. But a lot of it, like the the drums and bass, and probably about half the guitars are already finished. And uh, so yeah, uh-huh. it's been uh, it's been really cool. Different style for me, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're you're familiar with the you know a lot of the other stuff I've done, which has been more kind of traditional metal or yeah. more kind of blues based metal if you want to call it that this is a lot more into the heavier kind of industrial I, yeah yeah of def- definitely now uh, definitely makes you uh, makes you think and gives you um, a little more um, you know stuff to do on the guitar now um, let me ask you um, like you said you've joined been over there been in the band a couple of years now um, do you still feel like the new guy or I mean how, how well do you feel that the, the um, fans have accepted you into the band oh I think it it went really smoothly. I, I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm a part of the group. Uh, That's great. That's, as, yeah. as much as anybody, yeah. I mean, they, they were all um, real welcoming to me. Yeah. And a couple of the guys I had already known, the, you know, the singer, Matt Zane, I'd known him for, for years, really, beforehand. So it wasn't like I was meeting strangers, you know, when yeah, I joined yeah, yeah. the band. Yeah. Well, that, that's that's cool too that you're not just going into a band of guys that you don't um, have any history with. Now, um, do you have a projected release date for this? Like you said, you guys are still kind of in the recording process, but do you think it'll come out sometime this year or maybe next year? I definitely expect it to come out this year. Oh, uh, we don't have a solid release date for yeah, it. Yeah. Part of that, part of the reason for that is that we're recording it, but even once the album is actually done, you know, then we're going to be shopping it you know trying to find the label that will be yeah, yeah. Uh, able to promote it and release it in in the way that we would like and so even once the album is finished sometimes that process takes a long time so oh, yeah. I, I would be surprised if it didn't come out this year but uh within know. this year i yeah. yeah i can't i can't say for sure and, you know um and society one they've all they're already like an established act but the cool thing is like when you're trying to shop this to a prospective label you know um Oddly enough, Maxwell, um, they, they will say, you know, our, our new guitar player is Maxwell Carlisle, and um, that's going to be somewhat of a selling point now. Um, what do you feel that you bring into the band that maybe wasn't there before like with the previous guitar players? Well, uh, I know the the previous guitar player in the band, the guy who immediately preceded me, I, I know him and I've talked to him a little bit, more of an acquaintance, you know, yeah, yeah. but, um, you know, and, and he's definitely a great guitar player he's also a very good engineer and producer oh, okay uh, a guy named alex but uh as far as what i bring to the band i have that more kind of traditional metal sensibility okay yeah, and yeah, so yeah. when i do uh you know when i do my solos i think even though some of the riffs in the songs yeah. are kind of more modern sounding when i do my lead parts it it, it flavors it with a little bit more of that kind of classic metal feel. And there are a couple of songs um, that I've, you know, on the new album that, uh, you know, I was heavily involved in the writing of the riffs and the structure of the songs and all that stuff. And I I mean, when I listen to it, yeah. it's obvious to me that it's a song that I wrote compared to the other material. Okay. So it's yeah. a little bit more, a little bit more melodic, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, and the other part of it is, I think, in terms of the dynamics of the personalities in the band, I think I am a good fit 
for the other guys. Oh, so I think that's great. a big that's a big part of it too. That's great, and you know, like you said, you primarily have done or are known for doing like instrumental um, solo guitar type um, music. Now, of course, this is the first band you've been. You also were briefly um, for a few years also a member of a classic heavy metal band, uh, Hellion, and um, you guys had a great lineup and. Um, and I know you all are currently um, busy with other projects, but I was, have you had any contact with um, Anne or any of the other uh, members of Hellion? Any chance that you guys may um, get get back together one day? Well, I'll tell you this, and it's kind of funny that we're having this conversation now. Yeah. Because just recently, Anne Boleyn, you know, lead singer of Hellion, yeah. she has kind of been drumming things up a little bit and I, I haven't talked to her about it directly personally yeah. yeah but yeah but i get the feeling she's kind of itching to get out there again and either do a new album or or get back uh, get out on the road again and i would love that you know yeah, yeah. um i really enjoy i really enjoy uh hell you know the hellion material and and playing in that band and and honestly there is a complete album live album Wow, that's been recorded and it's it's done, uh, and but because the band has not been able to tour because you know the members have different obligations yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. because the band hasn't been able to tour, uh, you know we've been sitting on that album, wow. and, you know not releasing it. So uh, basically, as far as I'm concerned, as soon as everybody can get their schedules to mesh wow. and to work together, I think we'll be ready to go and. We'll probably put that live album out and and hit the road. That's, that's what I think. You yeah. know, that's what my intuition tells me. I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah. But that's yeah. hopeful, hopeful, uh, hopeful projection there because that would be definitely a cool thing to um, um, have for, for the fans. Now, um, like I know one of the guys from home you played with, um, Simon Wright, the drummer. He, he's also currently touring um, on the Dio Hologram tour. I was. Um, I yeah. think if you if you had a chance to ever catch that. No, not the hologram tour. I've seen him play with with other bands several times, yeah, yeah. but uh, I have not seen that that hologram tour. <laughs> yeah, I would kind of like to talk to some people, you know, yeah, like one on one personally, uh, who have seen it and just kind of get their feedback on it because I know obviously it's very um, controversial to say controversial, <laughs> kind of polarizing in some ways. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, um, have you ever got a chance to see him play with um, the Dio Disciples, which is basically um, um, Ronnie James Dio's like surviving band members like Craig Goldie and Simon and a couple of other guys because um, I got a chance to catch one of their shows and I, I tell you um, it's like nothing you've ever seen it's like these guys are getting up there and really doing it for the love of um, Ronnie and the night I seen these guys play like in Anaheim it was almost like electric church they had everybody up on their feet you know it was just amazing <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 and um, now another project I want to ask you I know um, I was reading you're involved in this thing called um it's an Eli Musk tribute uh, band called um, Ra Rapper Command. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because it seems like a, quite an interesting concept there. <laughs> yeah, well, sure, and th and thanks for bringing that up because it's a, it's a fun it's a fun project. So yeah, this is a, a it's a band, it's a power metal band, really. Okay. Called Raptor Command, and it's funny because it's called Raptor Command, the heavy metal tribute to Elon Musk. But of course, when you think of tribute, you think of like a tribute, like a cover band, right? That's what I, that's what I love course. about this. You know, typically right. I think it, you'd be doing other people's music. It's a tribute to like this big guy, you know, big industry guy. But um, I love the fact there's a different kind of tribute that you're, you're paying tribute to somebody, but not by playing their music, by um, writing music about them. That's kind of an interesting concept there. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's really what it is. But I think sometimes... You know, I'll give you a little bit of backstory, but but I think just to start off with, I think some people are confused in that they think it's an outright parody band, and that's really not the case. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You know, it's we go we go into it where you know we it's it's meant to be entertaining, right? Yeah, we yeah, want yeah. people to have a good time, and so there's a certain fun aspect to it, and we really want that to be there. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we. You know, the band is sort of a vehicle to bring awareness to certain things, which me personally and the other guys in the band agree. You know, we want more attention to be, uh, you know, placed upon these certain things. So, you know, and a lot of it is, uh, thing, you know, uh, space exploration, you know, oh, okay. and the possibility, yeah, yeah. you know, the possibility of humanity living on other planets, 
uh, you know, electric cars, uh, you know, renewable energy, things like that. And of course, that's all stuff yeah. that Elon Musk is directly involved in. And the way it got started was I was sitting around one day uh, talking with a buddy of mine, and I was reading some article, you know, news article yeah. about Elon Musk. And they're talking about, you know, they have all these technical terms in there. And, and I, I turned to him and I said, man, this is some of this stuff would make really great lyrics for a metal song. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Because, like, if you go uh, and you look at SpaceX, right, which is one of Elon's companies, yeah. the, uh, the rocket is called the Falcon, okay? Yeah. That one of the engines is called the Raptor engine. Another engine is called the Merlin engine. And I, I'm like, man, this is like golden power metal lyrics right yeah, here. Yeah, 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 wow. So that's kind of where the spark came from. But then, uh, you know, so I started, like, thinking of, oh man, you know, this is a crazy idea. Who could I get, you know, to, to be involved in this? And so I kind of just went through my, uh, you know, uh, virtual Rolodex or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and so now uh, Ty Christian, who's a.k.a. Fang von Raffenstein from Lords of the Trident. Oh, wow, wow. He's, oh. <laughs> he's singing, you know, he's the lead singer. Oh, that's cool. Um, I had no idea he was involved. Yeah, he's a, uh, man, he, he's quite a character himself, much like Elon Musk. I've interviewed I've interviewed Fang a couple of times, and man, he he really when you're interviewing him or just even talking to him, he, he really stays in character, and it makes oh, yeah. it makes for a fun interview for me because I kind of we just really get into free form and just wherever the conversation goes, it goes. Yeah, no, he's great. I mean, he's a great singer. Yeah. Really, he has his shit together just as a person, and he's extremely creative also. So I mean, he's just a great guy to work with. Ask you, did uh, um, did you hook up with him through our mutual friend, the Lord of PR? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, I think I did originally meet him through uh, that guy. Yeah, yeah, well, how cool is that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a small, uh, small you know, it's a small uh, marketing world. Yeah. Wow, that's um, cool. <laughs> I have no idea. But yeah, no, Ty, uh, Ty's great, and his voice is you know just. Uh, Perfect, you know, for that band and a uh, great singer. And then the, the rest of the band, uh, a couple of guys that I've known for a while, a guy named Deacon Lacrosse, who uh, plays guitar, and a guy named Jericho Law, and he plays bass. And Jericho and Deacon, they've been in a couple other bands together, and I've done some projects with kind of shredder stuff with Deacon in the past. And, oh, how cool. And then, um, so, uh, and, and so, um, yeah, uh, let's see here. Um, Jericho, uh, Jericho Law on bass, Deacon Lacrosse on guitar, and then Sean Elg, who's a great, incredible drummer, and he plays in Cage oh, wow, with wow. Sean Peck, yeah. and he also plays in Nihilist, I mean, he plays in a lot of these great thrash bands and stuff, and so he plays drums, wow. and it's, uh, you know, so it's a, you know, it's a five-piece, I do, so, you know, the uh, other guitar stuff, and I also do, like, a lot of uh, keyboard stuff and everything. Oh, wow, that, that that's cool, so, so, um... So, so you actually you you, you, um, you actually handle the keyboards as well as the guitar. That's cool. I do. Yeah. There's there's actually one song. So we. Um, yeah, I guess that you know the, to to wrap all this up, the, the thing I should say about that band uh -huh. is we've just finished the debut full length album. We had released several singles. Uh huh. And then what we did was we we did a Kickstarter campaign oh. to to fund a full length album. It was you know, successful. We had some really crazy stretch goals where we were going to launch a satellite to broadcast the music <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. And we didn't quite reach that, didn't quite get yeah. there. But we were able to fund just the basic album. And so that was that was great. And we've just now uh, completed the album and we've sent the tracks out to the, you know, the Kickstarter backers and everything. So we'll have some actual like physical stuff uh, available in a, in a couple of months. Well, but well, when, when that comes out, I'd love to um, do a follow-up interview with you just specifically about that and to really push the album. But, you know, um, oh, yeah. now, now it's it's cool, cool concept because uh, when you hear like it, I, I remember initially reading about it and thinking, oh, that's kind of interesting, Elon uh, must tribute. So, so initially myself, I'm thinking, okay, so are these songs that are already or are specifically written about Elon Musk, which it doesn't really sound like that's um, the direction you went, but like you said, you're, I know you're into um, space exploration. So, um, like, like, what, what are the songs specifically about about space explorations, or maybe about things you'd read about Elon Musk in the news, or um, what was the songwriting process like for that? Sure. Well, well, like I said, I mean, these the, the stuff that comes up, <laughs> just just the 
the uh, phrases, you know, and the, the sentences and stuff that, yeah. that come up when you're talking about Elon and the things that he does. <laughs> it's incredible. It's it's such good lyric material for a metal song. So, <laughs> um, so basically, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, there's a song called Falcons Over Moscow. Okay. Okay. And this is a this is a really fast, you know, power metal tune. You know, great shredding solos and really, you know, keyboard arpeggios and stuff. Really great, in my in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a great power metal song. Wow. But Falcons Over Moscow. You listen to the lyrics, and what what we did was what happened when SpaceX. You know, when the rocket company when they first came on the market, everybody was. Like, all oh, these guys aren't going to do anything. They don't know what yeah. they're doing. It's the, some stupid new company, whatever. At the time, Russia was the primary, like, launch provider for satellites and stuff. They kind of had a monopoly on the market in wow, some wow, ways. Wow. Wow. And, okay, so Moscow is in Russia, obviously. So what happened was over the course of, like, four or five years, SpaceX, they grew so much and they did so well yeah, yeah. that they stole all the business from Russia. Yeah. And so now we've got this song called Falcons Over Moscow. So it's it's talking about how, you know, SpaceX came up and yeah. basically dominated, you know, the rocket market over the over the Russian government. You know, and I, when when you when you when I explain it like that, yeah. it sounds kind of like dry and technical, you know. But we made it work in just these awesome metal lyrics. Well, and, I, I could see that because I mean, yeah. I mean, even take a even take like a. Um, a, a band like Tesla, and it's kind of interesting because, um, you know, a lot of people, I mean, unless you're into history, might not have any idea who Nikola Tesla was, but, but right. a lot of people just being a Tesla fan, they know who that is. So it's interesting sometimes when bands, you know, they, they base their music or their band around somebody else, and um, it's kind of a teaching thing for people. It's, and, and I think, I love the way you did put this band together for a simple fact is it's kind of labeled as a tribute to Elon Musk, but it's not really your typical tribute band. Yeah. Yeah, so I think our biggest challenge at this point is just communicating to people what the band is really about, you know, because there's, there's to my knowledge, there's no other band like this. I think at some point there was a band where all of their songs were about Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think. But oh, wow, that's kind of interesting. I mean, yeah. Even like, uh, even if you compare it to like a band like Manowar, I mean, um, oh, yeah. it's quite different, but, you know, they, they were like really into, you know, um, all that, uh, you know, neoclassical stuff, and, and they, they wrote about that, that stuff, but that's, um, that's what the ba band was based around, and it, it kind of, um, you know, they had a huge following and, and everything, so it's kind of interesting... Like, that's the thing I say, like, if you are going to form any kind of tribute band, I, I love a lot of the tribute bands for a simple fact. To me, it's rock and roll theater. You know, your typical tribute bands where, you know, but let's sure. be honest, there's a half a dozen, like, Led Zeppelin and Kiss tributes out there. So um, if you're going to compete with all the ones that are already existing, you got to have something, you know, special um, to offer to people, you know. I mean, they're, they're bands that they, they really look the part. But, uh, and so they're giving, their, they're giving people come to the show a little something, you know, extra. But... Um, like I said, that's why um, you're not a typical tr uh, tribute band. And, and when people come to the show, they, they're going to kind of wonder, oh, what is this? And Elon Musk tribute, they're going to maybe come and see you one, once. And when they come, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll get into what you guys are doing. But, but the cool thing about it is, like you said, they're not cover tunes. It's original music. And, and I kind of dig that, you know? Yeah, well, uh, and thank you, man. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that the concept is so unique and interesting that that will the concept will entice people to come and then you know hopefully obviously they'll they'll like the music so much that you know they'll stay for the songs and stuff. yeah and it's kind of uh, mentioned you mentioned the band cage because um, mm. um another guy that i've um, interviewed several times over years and just recently is um sean peck that lead singer from cage he's got he's got like he's in like four or five different bands at one you know one time and, and his current thing he's got going at the three trimmers um yep. you know he's still still with cage he's got death dealer he plays with Hank Sherman. Um, and, and so, like, when people hear about this band that you're in, the, the Elon Musk tribute band, um, a lot of people are going to, oh, Maxwell Carly, oh, yeah, he's that guitar shredder guy. So they, they're going to go maybe expecting to hear, like, a shredder type um, type of guitar player doing that type of show. When they come, it's going to be something completely different, you know? But that's a cool thing at the same time because um, the fact that you, you're a great shredder, you can do, you know, uh, you're in society one and they're more like you said industrial type metal so 
you know, you, you're capable of doing more than one just thing, you know. <laughs> well, thank you, man. I, yeah. I appreciate you saying that. You know, it's, I think, it's one thing to be proficient yeah. in one particular style, but, uh, you know, when when you're able to adapt to other musical situations, yeah. I think it, it just kind of, you know, opens up so many more doors for you and so forth. Yeah, so, you know, now, now you got Rapper Command and you, and you got um, Society One and maybe... Hell, you know, the, the cool thing, like I said, this is not the first society one. It's not like the first band you've ever really been in. But for several years, you did do the solo thing. So what's it like now to be, um, be, be in bands where um, you're, like, you're playing with other people, um, where like when people come to the show, not all eyes are on you, like if you're doing a solo gig or something like that. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're part of the team, if you know what I mean, as opposed to the main guy. <laughs> well, I, uh, I like it yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's... Uh, you know, it's better for me in a lot of ways. In one, you know, in one aspect, over the past three or four years, I think I've, I don't know how to say it, I think I've kind of relaxed a lot as far as um, the kind of the weight of my role yeah, in yeah. a band. So it's easier for me to go in and collaborate with people because I'm not, you know, I don't hold on to my uh, my ideas as yeah. closely as I used to. But by that I mean, yeah. if somebody you know disagrees with me, if they don't like what I came up with, it's like, eh, okay, you know, it's not gonna like make or break the band. Yeah, you you move on. You know, you you try a different idea. Um, I guess you know after being in several bands and doing a lot of different recordings and working with different people. I think that there are so many different factors as to what can make a band successful or yeah, not yeah. successful. You know, and so when you when you get into these times where you're arguing with somebody over some like, no, I want to go to a G. No, I want to go to an F sharp. You know, like yeah, yeah. just really like petty things. I, I I feel like I've gotten a lot better at kind of letting go of those things. And so uh, in that you know on that hand, it's easier for me to work with other people. And yeah. then on the other hand. Man, to be to be totally honest with you, I just got really burned out doing my solo stuff. Because, well, yeah, you know, and, and I would think too. Um, I would yeah. think too, like when when you have your own solo thing going, you know, you really are the man in charge in the sense that all the decisions fall on you and everything. You know, it, like if you put out a great um, album that everybody loves, and you know, great, then you can take the, the accolades for that. But if um, you know, put out an album and everybody's saying it stinks and all that, then, then again, uh, you get all the credit for that. Is well, uh, yeah. and, and you know, where as a solo artist too, I would think a lot more pressure is on your shoulders as opposed to being just a member, uh, you know, one fourth of, of a band, you know, where um, you got other guys to lean on and it's not all about you. And, and, and you do have the, you do have the ability more to collaborate with other people and, and, and really truly contribute and feel that your contribution really, you know, matters in a way that it did before. <clears throat> You know, the other the other part of that is with my solo band. I was putting my solo band together really from scratch and from the ground up, and so I was trying to develop myself as an artist from the ground up. At the same time, I was trying to develop this solo band around me as an artist. And yeah. So, you know, I think it's a different situation if you're like. You know, you play in White Snake for ten years. Yeah. You know, and then you do a solo thing, yeah, yeah. And that kind of stuff. But you know, I was kind of starting, you know, with the solo stuff just as the, the foundation. Yeah, and it, I think, yeah. you know, you know, then it's like, well, you know, you, you got to convince other people that this is going to go somewhere, and um, you know, and and you know, I, I did that in in you know, I had some success at that, but yeah. it was just so much work, man. I just yeah, got, yeah. And I just got burned out on it, so I'm. Yeah, I guess. Was, yeah, I guess you, know, you get burnt. Regret, burnt you know, yeah. I'm glad I did those things. I could see you getting burnt out too, in the sense that, like, um, now see, they're, they're they're guys that are great shredders like you, but they they kind of tend to overplay, and it's more about being a flashy player and showing how everybody how fast you can play. But you're one of those guys that you you, you really play for the song and everything. Um, you know, like if you listen to any of your solo albums, not every song sounds the same, and, and you know. So, but but the point being is. When you're making instrumental music, you got to really be that kind of player. You got to really deliver 
good and 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 because if you know if any if people are going to just sit there and listen to a bunch of instrumentation you got to be able to keep their attention where i think it'd be a little easier going in where, where you got vocals and and their lyrics to the songs you know people you're able to keep their attention span a little more um if you know what i mean sure yeah i think you're absolutely right and, and um now like i said you're, you're a great shredder max and and um and you have put out great instrumental stuff but um now that you're with Society One and, and you've had up to play with these other bands, um, are you um, actually writing lyrics now? Like when you write songs, are you still just doing mainly the guitar stuff? <clears throat> well, I, I do write lyrics, but I don't write lyrics in Society One. Okay, okay. That is, uh, you know, Matt is the singer and he's also the founding member. Remember, of the that band, makes sense, so. makes sense, yeah. So he's, he's definitely, you know, he doesn't. He doesn't want anybody writing his lyrics. You know, okay, so. but, but you, you have um, branched out as a lyric writer, too. That's, that's cool. <laughs> and and um, what's that been like for you? Like, like again, you're, you're mostly like a riff writer. So when you started writing um, lyrics, um, what was that like for you? Or how, um, what was that process, you know, as far as learning how to um, do it the right way and that? <clears throat> well, I, I really enjoy it, and I think it's a very rewarding yeah. experience because when you write a lyric and, a, like, a melody with yeah. it, and you, you, just, you just go through that whole process of coming up with it and then trying to, you know, get it to fit the rest yeah. of the music. And then you make tweaks to it and little changes here and there. And then you finally actually hear the finished product, like it's been recorded or yeah, it's yeah. been performed or something. And you hear it and it works and it, it, yeah. it goes over well and people enjoy it. It's a really, really uh, rewarding experience. I think as far as... You know, there, there's writing lyrics, and yeah. then there's writing the melody and the rhythm of the lyrics, which yeah, see, I think in yeah. some ways is just as important. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm not a musician, so I really have no idea uh, what you're really talking about. Now, here, here's my point that I was trying to make, is like, as a, a, a fan of uh, music, and somebody sits down and listens to music a lot, um, like when I'm listening to inst instrumental music, for example, you know, it's just pure instrumental, got no vocals or no voice or anything in it, um... I kind of listen to these tunes and, and, it, and it evokes certain like emotions, maybe a positive, maybe a angry or whatever emotion may be going through me at the time after I, when I'm listening to this, as opposed to when I hear a song that's got lyrics, which is more of um, like storytelling, if you know what I mean. You listen to the song, okay, well, this is, this is what they're talking about, or this is um, what the song was written about, or this is what I, the way I'm interpreting this song, as opposed to just um, like, again, when you listen to an instrument, maybe even when you're creating it, maybe it's based more on an emotion versus storytelling. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, you make a really good point there. And and both are good, you know, it's just, um, it's a different way of doing it is my point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess when I write both lyrics and, and even instrumental stuff, I usually don't focus too much on telling a story. Usually yeah. with me, it's more about what fits the song, yeah. <laughs> conveying certain feelings or, yeah, con conveying, I guess, a message. You okay, know, sort of that's your a message. message across, yeah. But yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, like, a, like a, you know, a plot or a storyline or something like oh. that. But obviously a lot of wonderful songs are written that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, everybody, like I said, everybody has a different... Now, um, getting back to um, Rapid Command, I was cu curious, have you heard... Um, do you have any uh, clue of Elon Musk or any of his people heard about what you guys are doing or what they think? <laughs> well, I, I do know that, you know, some people from some, some of his companies and uh -huh. from, some people from SpaceX have heard the music. Yeah. And they seem to, to really get a kick out of it. As far as Elon himself, I, I uh -huh. have no idea. Okay. I mean, I am, of course, curious about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've heard, I've heard a couple of people who... Like I, I shouldn't say their names, but there have yeah, been a couple of people yeah. from SpaceX who contacted me and told me that they sent it to him. Wow. wow. But I don't, I mean, they could be, I mean, obviously it's a big company, so it yeah, yeah. might not have actually reached him or... Who knows, yeah. Maybe he hated it, I don't know. Yeah. So. Well, I think I think if um, he had heard it and that was the case, you, you, you may have heard, heard, heard from him one way or the other. But, um, you know, how cool would that be, like, if you were to... Um, get some kind of um, invitation to like play one of his corporate events. I mean, that could you imagine? <laughs> oh yeah. And of course we would, we would do that in a heartbeat. You know, that would yeah. be great. And so, um, in regards to that album, um, how many, how many tunes are going to be on the um, album? It's 10, 10 tracks. And, um, 
And so you said you, you kind of wrote those and recorded them over, I guess, the last um, five years. Is that correct? Well, no, it wasn't that long. It was more like uh, maybe two and a half years. And, and as far as recording, like, um, I know you have your own home studio. Like, um, was everything recorded there? Or did you do it the modern way? Like, um, the, different guy, the different members would do their own parts and you kind of piece it together once everything was recorded? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, man, to be totally honest, the recording process was messy. It was, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, um, so, Bang, you know, he lives in Wisconsin, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. in L.A. Yeah. Uh, Sean, you know, the drummer, he's down in, like, San Diego, so. You're spread, um, scattered all over, yeah. Yeah, we were all spread around. Um, the, also, like, you know, there were just weird little details, like, um, Deacon, uh, you know, the other guitar player, he kind of, like, completely like he moved a couple of times wow, just wow. To like to different <laughs> cities and so his recording uh setup changed drastically like during like halfway through the album wow. so, um yeah it, it was there were some challenging things especially with the drums we had to do some really funny kind of things but um it you know it worked out in the end but yeah it's definitely uh i guess you could call it a very modern recording technique where it's kind of pieced together well that, that's cool though i mean just think about that i mean at the end of the day, you're gonna have a great album deliver. We hope, and and um, at the end of the day, um, sometimes when you have to go through that, that kind of, um, you know, that um, you know, like you said, it's kind of a mess making it or whatever. It took a lot to um, create it, but in the end, when you hold that CD in your hand or whatever, and you hear the final product, um, it, it's gonna be a great uh, a great story to tell. If you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, it makes the it makes the destination that much better you know when the when the journey is long yeah yeah, and, and maybe silly because we're just we're just talking about the debut album coming out but um it, have you given any thought about um where the band is going to go in the future i mean is this just a one album project is this something you hope to carry on with for, or is it just one of those things that kind of depends on how people um react to the debut album well i can say a couple of things about that one is obviously we will listen to the people who listen, you know, who uh, purchase it. You know, purchase it, of course, yeah. And if if people want us to do more, then of course that's going to encourage us. Um, I personally, I do want to continue. You know, I'm I'm hopeful that people will will respond will respond well to it. I I really love working on those songs and 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 uh, you know all the guys in the band. Mm-hmm. I think everybody has a really good time. Just being in the band, everybody gets along really well. It's really a cool group of guys. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I expect it to go, you know, indefinitely onwards. You know, and it might be the kind of thing where, you know, we go a few years between albums. Yeah, yeah, you know, it yeah. might not. It might not be like quite as active as other bands, but yeah, uh, yeah it's it's such a fun project, man. I, I want to yeah. see it continue on. Yeah, um, and let me ask you because. Um you know, the fact that everybody is so spread out, um, like, when you get thought to, like, uh, doing live shows, um, would that have to be, like, a matter of taking it on the road, do you think, or just, like, kind of doing um, shows that are spread out, you know, here and there? I think it would be more doing shows that are spread out because the band is so unique, yeah, you know, yeah. because of the concept. Yeah. I think it's going to be the kind of band that, ju- that just does a handful of, like, you know, kind of more... Uh, I don't want to say important, but more kind of uh, higher profile shows as opposed to doing like, you know, 20 or 30 smaller shows in a row, you know, like, yeah. like I think it's more just about doing key shows yeah, yeah. and really nailing those ones uh, rather than doing a, a traditional tour. And, and it, it, it get, it really uh, be a great way to kind of build the fan base there because, um, I mean, you kind of all, you and other guys, you got your built-in fan base already. People are already going to come just to check the show out because you guys are in it but at the same time um, you're also going to get people hearing about the band for the first time when they pick up the CD or whatever and, oh this is an interesting band okay yeah if they ever play live I'd love to go check it out and um, so so um, I, I just want to wish you all the luck with that I mean I mean, I, this is a very interesting project and I, I just wish you guys all the um, luck in the world when, when it comes out now um, did you say you, you have a release date for that yet or that's something you're working on currently it's something we're working on, but it's pretty close. It's uh-huh. probably, you know, if I had to guess, it's probably like a couple of months from now. The only, the only reason it's a little um, uh, un- 
uncertain is because we're still fulfilling the tail end of the Kickstarter campaign oh, okay. things. Okay. You know, we're, okay. we're mailing T-shirts and stuff like that, you know, to people. And we just, we have to make sure that everybody involved in that, they get all of the stuff that they're Promise. owed. Yeah. we yeah. got to make sure that gets to them first, and then we're going to focus on a, a public release. Wow, well, okay, that make, makes sense. Now, um, I was also reading um, on your site that um, you're an avid, you're, um, you're an avid guy that goes on YouTube as far as... Um, you record a lot of stuff and post, I guess you got your own YouTube channel. And I was reading as of 2017, I think you had like 50,000 subscribers. That That's uh, quite a following there. Thanks, man. I mean, it, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that has, YouTube has become a really important thing for me. And it's become a really big part of, you know, what I spend my time on. And so what and, do people get if they go to your YouTube channel? I mean... Uh, again, that's quite a that's quite an accomplishment. So you must be giving them um, a lot of great stuff there. <laughs> Thanks, man. I, I hope so. It, it it has gotten a really good response, and I felt like uh, I felt like it's really kind of building a momentum. So you know, when, when we talk again uh -huh. about Raptor Command or or further down the road, even you know, um, you know, we can kind of check in on the YouTube stuff again because it's really been. Kind of building up, building up steam. But but I'll tell you, the YouTube stuff has completely changed from what it, the way I think about yeah. uh, the music industry and marketing and and stuff like that. Just to give you a, a quick example, you know the NAM convention in Anaheim every year, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you know, obviously, you know, everybody's all the guitar players, all the musicians, everybody wants to go to the NAM show, and it's like if you don't get invited, you're trying to kind of kind of scam your way in like yeah, talk yeah, to somebody yeah. you know somebody and this guy it's like a standard thing right yeah yeah and i was one of those guys for a long time so um you know and then i and then i got in somewhat legitimately because i was in hellion and i was like you know autographing stuff or whatever for yeah. companies and that was great but when i started doing the youtube stuff like this year and last year instead of me trying to get in <laughs> Now, the, the PR people from NAM they contact me, and they're asking me to come. Wow, wow, that's amazing. You know, they're like, please come. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we want you to come down here so you can look at all this stuff, and then you can tell your audience about it. You know, it's good for business. It's good for the vendors and everything. And so they're asking me, trying to get me to come down. And before, in the other situation, when you're in that other role where yeah. you're, you're – I don't, want to, I don't want to say just a musician because I'm not trying to degrade yeah. anybody. But when you're in a different role that might not be valued as much in you know to to certain people. So going through that change where I, I was you know I was like a, another guy in a band and it's yeah. like, that's a great thing to do. I love playing guitar in bands, but there's a lot of people who do that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I so mean, going from that role to yeah. be now, you know, now they. I don't call myself this, but now they call me like a, a, a social media influencer, right? That's what they call me, yeah. right? And so yeah. cha that change in my role really opened up my eyes to how the position you have within the industry really dictates, you know, your influence and your value to other people in the industry. And it's, it's been a, kind of a, a, you know, a revelation this year for me. Well, it, it's amazing because, you know, this other guy I've interviewed several times over the years, um, me and him go way back from, uh, I kid you not, if you if you even remember what um, MySpace was. And, uh, oh, sure, yeah. And, he, and um, then Facebook kind of took over. And, and uh, we've been friends in that, chitting, chatting for like the last 10 or 15 years. Now, this guy's an independent artist, um, like, like a lot of uh, musicians. Um, he was in bands like in the early 80s not, nothing like you heard of but like just locally he's from chicago and um and i was like common demo you know besides um being a fan of your music you know he he's a great like he, he designs all his art, album covers and he's a great artist as well and so, well um all these years people are following him on facebook they're buying his cds and now in addition to selling his cds and that um on his site um, people are hiring him because, like me, they've commented what a great artist he's. He's designing other people's album covers. He's branched out into doing T-shirts and stuff. It's just amazing if you know how to market yourself, um, what you can do with that. Yeah, it it 
it really is. I mean, it's it it blew my mind, and I yeah. You know, I, I talk to you about it now, and we're talking about it as if like, oh yeah, it's it's of course, I, you know, it's an obvious thing. Well, it's a but, lot of it's a lot of hard work too because you yeah. got to be dedicated, not, not just have talent, but um, you got to be dedicated to your craft. It takes a lot of work just to even. Um, I mean, in your case, you're a musician, so if you want people to check you out, you gotta you gotta constantly be updating your site. You gotta constantly be telling people what you're doing, giving them samples of your music, like you said, creating stuff for your YouTube site. You, you gotta let people know you're there, and then if you got any kind of um, talent or quality, people are gonna check it out. Now, like like you're saying, you got burnt out doing the solo thing, but you know what? Um, if you think about it, you were creating a brand, you were creating your name at the time, and from that. I think, you know, when it got to the point where you joined Hellion, I think you really, that kind of put you up, pushed you up a little more there. People started really, who didn't know you before, are starting to really pay attention because you're getting out there on the national touring market. And, and, and a lot of it is not just your talent, but your ability, you know, on social media, like you said, Max, to kind of really keep your name out there, make people know who you are. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're right. And I, I it always kind of kills me when I see when I see you know like there are, there are people I know you know guitar players yeah. and so forth and they are so good on their instrument you know they are just incredible incredible players yeah. and they've dedicated years and years and years decades sometimes yeah. to mastering their craft and they truly are you know virtuoso level but when it comes to marketing themselves they just tall they, they fall I should say yeah. totally flat and it it's like you know, yeah, you, you have to. It's kind of a package deal. It's like you can't yeah, well, only here, have yeah. ability in one area. You yeah. have to well, kind of. Well, here's what I always tell people. You know, like um, the music industry is a lot different than when you and I were growing up. I mean, um, back then the way it was done is, you know, you'd send a demo to the label, uh, or um, if you were heavily touring, people the label would come out and check a show out. They send an A and R guy out. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of bands do not even. There, um, there aren't record companies like there used to be. There aren't major labels like there used to be. You're lucky if you have a record de deal. And then even then, if the debut album doesn't sell, you know, ha half a million copies, okay, we're gonna mo move on to the next band. So, you know, in a way, um, like in the '90s when um, they started signing nothing but grunge bands because that was what was popular at the time, it became cookie cutter stuff. And you know, everything cycles every ten years. But the point is. Um, you know, the, the bands that really have a talent, they're the ones that survive and, you know, um, that 10 year cycle, and they're the ones that are still here, uh, you know, you know, doing it. Yeah, yeah, no, you're, you're right. I mean, it's. Uh... And, and, and like, if, a guy like you, you that knows how to market what you do, um, you don't really even need, I mean, of course, you'd rather be with the label, but you, you also have the power to release it independently if you want to. It allows you to have much more control of your music and how you promote it, as opposed to a guy in a suit telling you, "You know what? I don't hear, I don't hear a single. Go write me, a, you know, go write me a radio hit." Um, you know, you have a lot more um, freedom to promote yourself the way you want. I think, <clears throat> and, and at the same time, if you don't have a label behind you, if if you put out a hit album, you know, you get to keep all the profits, as opposed to having, um, you know, a record label gets a bigger piece of the pie. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, and it's uh, you know you 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 really are nailing on the head, I think, and and sometimes it, it's a little funny because in my position, you know, like I'm in Society One, yeah. that's a tradi you know it's a more traditional band, you know, trying to shop the records to the label, get the you know like yeah. you know that more, that more kind of traditional uh, business model, and then there's my solo and my YouTube stuff, which yeah. is totally totally different, and you know I sometimes I. Sometimes I kind of wish I could drag that uh, traditional business model. I, I wish I could kind of drag everybody into the same moder modern times a little bit. I think they'd be better off, you know. Yeah. I, I think uh, unless you're a pop star, I think you know a label is really not going to do much for you. So these days, yeah, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I mean. Um Again, you know, it's a lot harder doing it on your own, but at the same time, um, if you put out like a, you know, something that's popular and people are buying it, then, you know, the money goes to the right person in the sense that, um, you know, you're a songwriter, you're a creator, you're a musician, it's your album, it's your band, um, as opposed to, you know, 
you know, like a label who gets, um, you know, 90% of the um, profits and you get the other 10% <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. 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 And now, um, I also wanted to ask you, Matt, because um, also um, in regards to the Elon Musk tribute band, I was reading that you're, you're big into, um, one of your big interests is um, kind of space exploration. And I, I think I was reading you even um, belong to like a... Um, you're a member of a planetary uh, society. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that's all about? Sure, yeah, the, the Planetary Society. So the Planetary Society is the world's largest private space exploration advocacy group. So it's basically a group of people who are really passionate about space exploration and, and what it can do for humanity and so forth. And we just are, you know, trying to get you know, in some ways, trying to convince the government that, you know, NASA needs more funding or something like that. Like, that's a practical approach. But it's just trying to get people excited about space exploration and, uh, you know, going to Mars and you know, all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Okay, now, and, now being a musician, yeah. I was curious, in conjunction with that, do you ever, like, have you ever thought about, like, putting on, like, a fundraising concert or something like that? Or do you guys put on any special events? Well... Not, not, a con not, you know, they don't do concerts or anything like that. Um, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know how many musicians, other musicians are in, into that, yeah. into this, in, you know, members, but, um, I mean, they definitely do, they definitely do fundraising things. And then they even, I mean, the, as an example, they did a, a thing called the light sale mission. Um, sometimes it actually pops up in science fiction a lot, but yeah, yeah. do you hear something, people talk about a light a light sail where you use the inertia of photons from the sun to actually push like a reflective material in space. Wow. And it, it shows up in science fiction, but it's an actual thing that like it actually does work in physics and everything. So yeah. uh, they were able to, just through fundraising, they were able to, I think it was like $2 million they were able to raise and they may they were able to build and then subsequently launch a miniature. It's called a CubeSat, which is a really really tiny tiny satellite. Um, but it had a, this big solar sail, and so this thing that it basically they kind of hitch a ride on a rocket, like a rocket is going oh, up, wow, and they're wow. launching some big, you know, some big expensive satellite. And like on the way up, they chuck this little thing out, you know. And uh, so they they were able to build this thing get the launch arrangements done and then it goes up there and it pops out this huge mm -hmm. sail and it doesn't last very long you know it's but it it goes up there for a little while it has a camera on it it has some mm -hmm. sensors and test equipment and stuff just to kind of show that that concept works you know and then it gets it gets other companies or uh, it gets companies and other organizations mm -hmm. interested in that technology so they they have, it's a very active organization, you know, they, they yeah. do things like that, well, but yeah, it's, and let me ask you, it's um, pretty geeky, but I love yeah. that stuff. Me, so. What was the point in your life, like, when you became interested in, like, um, space, and, that was a matter, like, seeing science fiction, you know, when you were growing up, like, movies and stuff on TV? Yeah, I can't, I can't pick one exact point, yeah. I mean, definitely, it goes pretty far back. Oh, uh, cool. You know, I, I enjoyed science fiction movies and, and even books, but I think the main thing was I was exposed to aviation, like airplanes and stuff oh, at wow. a very young age. I had a, a grandfather who was in the Air Force, and then I built, like, model airplanes and stuff with my dad when I was a little kid. And so I was, I was you know, really into airplanes and stuff, and it's a pretty short jump from airplanes to spaceships, you know, so you know, and I, I think, think that's where yeah. it started. And, you know, I think uh, um, when people think of Maxwell uh, Carlyle, they, they think automatically uh, master guitar shredder, but, um, you know, um, like a few years I've known you and, and doing these interviews and getting to know you over the years and reading up on, you know, on what you're about, um, I think people would be surprised that um, you're not that one-dimensional in the sense that, um, you know, you're into space exploration. I know um, you and your wife are involved in... Um, like animal rights stuff, and I um, and I was re reading also. You're involved in something for like um, let's see, other two things I see here: uh, metal heads for homeless veterans foundation and rockers against human trafficking. Yeah. And, and how did you get involved with those, or just um, those things that kind of um, piqued your interest as well as far as, far as um, wanting to do something about those topics? Yeah, well, I mean, to be totally 
be honest, the, the last two things you mentioned, those were not things that I initiated myself. Those were things that other people came to me with and asked if I wanted to be involved. And there's such good causes. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, you know, of course, I, I, I wanted to get involved. What's but, it, yeah. to, you know, to your point about, you know, one dimensional and that kind of stuff, I used to have this idea. And I want to say this because I wish I could convince other people of yeah. Yeah. Kind of what I'm thinking here. I used to have this idea that you can really only dedicate yourself to one thing in life. Yeah. And it, you have to, you know, you talk to somebody and it's like, well, what do you do? You know, like, what's your career? Like, hey, there's this very pointed question and it, yeah. there's always this implication that you have one thing that your life kind of revolves around. And I think there's a stigma around that where <laughs> if you do different things, people assume that, oh, well, you're probably not that serious about any of them, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's just, it's just totally, totally wrong. And I, I was stuck in that mode of thinking for a long, long time, and it prevented me from pursuing a lot of things that I was interested in. Yeah. And I, I, over the course of several years, I think I was able to kind of change my thinking on it. I kind of kicked out some old habits, and I started pursuing a lot of things that I was passionate about, but I never, I never could justify like, oh, I'm going to focus my whole life on this, you know. Oh yeah. But there were still yeah. things I was really passionate about, and so I started pursuing things. And man, my, you know, my life right now, today, is the best it's ever been, and I think that is, you know, a good, a good part of the reason for that is because I was able to change that attitude, you know. And so now I do, I, you know, my music stuff. I love yeah. my music stuff. I do fitness and bodybuilding. I've done that for a long time, yeah. but it's something I'm passionate about. I'm interested in, you know, aviation and space exploration and, you know, uh, stuff related to rescuing animals and yeah. photography and yeah. doing the YouTube stuff. And I've, I've directed, like, I don't know, like more than 30 music videos at this point wow, for other wow. people yeah. and stuff. Again, that's something most, uh, your typical Maxwell Carlisle fan might not know, you know, e even directing the videos. And, and again, it's kind sure. of interesting because uh, I could see you getting into that, you know, as a, you know, through doing music and it, it, it kind of cross even the photography like they kind of overlap you know um like that's the other thing um that, that's kind of interesting I, I i see a lot of the cool photos that you have up on your um facebook page and stuff i know a lot of those are your photos you shot and it's cool to be able to you know like when you're a musician do those type of cool shots of you know you and your wife and other people but um See, that's the thing is, um, you started out as a musician. You got into the photography and this other stuff, and, and you're like more of a well-rounded guy, if you know what I mean. And, and um, it's kind of cool because, again, the photography and the music thing can overlap, and you could you could even do stuff with photography, just like doing stuff for other people. It's, it's totally a cool thing. Thanks, man. And I I hope I don't uh, I hope I don't come off as like I'm I'm not trying to like list my skills right no no like but, that, but, but the point i'm trying to make here with this is um see a lot of people um they when when especially when you're talking about a musician um or a group of musicians they have they have a certain uh image of that or they they, they think musicians aren't educated people but you know in a few years i've gotten to know you even just talking to you tonight you you do come across as a very um educated guy like you know you read you read up on all this stuff you read books um you know how to promote your stuff, you're into photography, you're into um, video directing, all this other stuff. And um, I think it makes for more of a, a you know, interesting story, if you will. Um, and, and it proves that um, musicians are not one dimension. I mean, not just musicians, but people in general are not just um, one, one dimensional. I mean, even take a guy like Gene Simmons. I mean, he's known primarily for being the lead singer and the bass player in Kiss, who wrote a lot of these great hit songs. But, um, He's also a producer. He's also done stuff in TV. He's uh, produced other bands. So, I mean, you can do more than just one thing is my point. Yeah, no, yeah. And I obviously, uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more, man. And I, I just hope that, you know, if anybody's listening out there and if they're, if they're thinking about that, the way that I used to think where, you know, it's like you, you worry that people won't take you seriously if you, if you do different things, you know, if you kind of, have different interests and stuff like that. I would, I would just say, don't listen to those worries. Just do the things you're passionate about, and I think it's, it can only, it can only.
only improve and, and help you, you know. And I think when you, the, you know, the different interests, right, the different yeah. things that you're into, they help each other, even if they're not directly related. Yeah, you yeah. know, if I, if I experience something, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, like the Raptor Command thing is a perfect example, right? If, if I hadn't been interested in actively studying and reading about this space exploration yeah. stuff, I never would have been like, oh, hey, I should do this crazy band idea about Elon Musk. Like, that never would have happened. And, and, and it's, you know, and I love that band, too. So, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just... Uh, and even even in, yeah. even in your musical projects, you got more than one thing going, you know. Because again, sure. I could see, like you said, you got burnt out doing the solo thing, because that's what you've done for so many years. Now you're in a power, me- you're doing power metal. Now you're doing industrial metal, um, and, and you got you got all these other things. And it, it's it's a it's a great thing too, because um, just to you know just to not be so bored in life. Like I mean, as great of a musician and a guitar player you, as you are. Um, how boring would it be if that was all there was in your life? So, you know, maybe when you're musical, uh, you know, you, you got some downtime in the, on the musical side of your life, maybe you get a photography gig or maybe, um, you know, you and your wife can do something on the weekend, you know, um, with the animal rights things. It keeps life more interesting. You got more than one thing to just kind of have your life be about. Yeah, dude, I, I totally agree, man. I totally agree. And um, before we wrap this up, because I know it's getting a little late, um, now, with you seeing how successful the YouTube, you know, stuff has been for you, and um, how people have reacted to the stuff you post up there, had you ever given any thought to like, um, like putting out like all that stuff together, maybe as a some kind of DVD or putting together like, um, you know, even even like an instructional DVD or something for people to buy? <clears throat> I think I I think I will do an instructional program of some kind it's yeah. actually something i've been thinking about for a yeah. long long time but i just haven't been able to yeah. carve out the time to do like a, a full length program yeah. i have done a few shorter things yeah, that yeah. are on my youtube channel where it's like one particular concept or lick that i'm teaching and people responded really well to those you know i got yeah. a lot of great feedback on that so i think that's definitely something that that will be in the future but mm-hmm. as far as the other stuff on my channel yeah you know, most of the stuff I do is reviews of equipment or demos or techniques for, you know, like a recording technique yeah. or something like that. Now, let me I ask tr- you, when, when you review, oh, like, sorry, let's say, uh, a certain guitar product or even a certain uh, type of guitar, um, do you ever hear back from the, um, you know, from, the, from that company that you're reviewing? Yeah, sometimes I do. And sometimes it's kind of funny because sometimes, you know, they won't see it for a long long time and so i've had a few companies contact me and say hey we just saw this review you did and it's something i did like six months ago and i completely forgot about it you know stuff like that and you ever got any endorsements or anything as a result or like any kind of um, relationship with these people just based off something you reviewed of theirs yeah i I have i wouldn't say endorsements but i have developed some relationships with with some of the companies where you know they really enjoyed my demo and so like effects pedal companies and yeah. things like that where they with the, if they have a new product yeah. like something that they're bringing out like a brand new thing they'll want to send it to me so i can let people know that it's new and that kind of stuff but it's funny with endorsements see this is another thing that's really changed for me yeah yeah when i was in you know a guy you know playing in bands and that was my main thing i'm always like man i wish i could get this endorsement yeah. i wish i could you know work with this company now they're coming to you <laughs> well well now they, they come to me but i can't endorse any one company oh, right yeah, because yeah. if i endorse one company that that makes all the other companies off limits to me and yeah. that would kill my you know then my, my i wouldn't have anything to do for my youtube channel so yeah, yeah. <laughs> i i have to stay you know neutral in the war right i have yeah, yeah. to stay uh you know un uncommitted to any particular company so oh, yeah, I hear in, in I hear a way it's yeah it's a little bit more freeing uh, than I, now that I'm not yeah. focused on it. Now, uh, I was reading on your official web page. You had an article about, um, I guess, some review you had up there on the YouTube channel. It was saying something about there was a certain guitar that um, I think could only be sold in Japan because um, cause it was not copyrighted or something. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Did you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, sure. No, that's that's one of the more, uh, uh, more popular videos. Yeah, there's a guitar. So there's a... A guitar company called Fernandez, and they are, they're not a huge company, but they're fairly well known. And in Japan, the f- 
Fernandez Company has like another brand name that they sell, and it's called Bernie. Wow. <laughs> and the problem is that they copied the Les Paul headstock almost exactly. Wow. <laughs> and when it comes to guitars and copyrights and trademarks, That's a big it's thing. actually the shape of the headstock, wow. which is the thing that is uh, the... That's the thing you're you're really not supposed to copy, right? And so, like the Fender headstock is is made to really exact dimensions. Yeah. And if another company copies that exactly, they'll they'll get in. Uh, you know, they can be a trademark lawsuit. I mean. And now let me ask you: well, What's the thing that can only be sold in Japan? I mean, like I guess what I'm asking is, I understand the thing with the copyright, but what would happen if? Um you know, somebody was to bring over uh, one of those guitars to the United States, would the company get in trouble or would the uh, person with the guitar, you know, get in trouble? No, I mean, an individual wouldn't get in trouble. Like, one person yeah, could yeah. bring in, they could, like, go to Japan, buy it, and then come back with it. They could do that and it'd be fine. But you couldn't sell it. Here. You couldn't sell it, like, in a retail store. You uh, couldn't do that. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. And now, um, as far as guitars, um, um, do you have a favorite one that um, you know that you uh, to play in that? Man, I I can't pick one. It's an impossible thing, you know. And and I'm always I'm always checking out new stuff. Yeah. So you know, even if, even if I had one today, next week I, I might one. have a new favorite. Now, um, like when you play guitar, I mean, uh, I mean. Like I'm not a musician myself. Like I said, I, I just listen to I'm a big fan of music. But um, like when when you're a musician, I mean, uh, to, to me, like there's some guitars. Um, again, not knowing nothing about how to play them, they, they look really, really cool. Just you know the shape and everything, and how they're shaped. But um, like um, when you're going to make an album, I guess what I'm asking is, um, what determines like what what uh, guitar you're going to use for a specific song? Does it is it um, more of how it's structured, or, or um, how do you how do you determine that? <laughs> sure. Well, I think a lot of it just has to do with what the guitar player is the most comfortable comfortable with in terms of the feel, right? Because yeah. the shape of the neck and the materials and the size of the frets on the mm -hmm. neck, all that stuff gives the guitar a unique feel just on your hands, yeah. and so. Different guitar players have different preferences. And so when you go to record something, you know, that's going to be recorded and that's going to be it forever, you want to be as smooth and, you know, uh, comfortable as you possibly can. So I think a lot of it has to do with that. Another part of it is the pickups in the guitar mm -hmm. will give it a different tone and it'll sort of react differently. It'll pick up different little nuances of your playing, like the angle you hold the pick at on the strings okay, okay. and things like that. And oh. the pickups will kind of um, send that out to the amplifier like in a, in a different way. It'll kind of accent different tones and stuff like that. And there's a big debate among guitar players yeah. as to if the type of wood, if that actually affects the tone. Some people say it's all in our minds. It doesn't make any difference at all, you know. And then there are other people who are like, no, no, it obviously has a huge difference in the tone. And you have mahogany versus alder versus ash and all this stuff. It's it's kind of funny. People get in pretty heated arguments about it sometimes. And where do you land on that uh, on that topic? I think it does make a subtle difference yeah, yeah. in the tone. And I think it's mostly, it's at the beginning of a note, like the attack. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, on a sustained note, I don't think you can really tell any difference at all. But I think the but, but probably the beginning when you're of the, uh, the attack is when you're a, at the level you are, you, you can't tell the difference as opposed to maybe a guy just starting out or who knows nothing about playing music. Well, that's true. I'm I'm sure there's a certain level of sort of a, an acquired listening ability when it comes to guitar. Yeah, and and, and as far as playing, I was curious um, when you were first starting out, did you like? I'm sure you learned other people's music, but um, did you get to a point where you could play by ear, or um, you know, did you take lessons in that? I I took lessons very early on for about six months uh, from a, a great guy named uh, Brian King, who was a you know he was a guy in my hometown that's a few years older than me, and you know, great guitar player. And then I took a handful of lessons, kind of sporadically, just down through the years, like yeah. a couple here and a couple here and that kind of thing. Yeah. As far as playing by ear, yeah. um, 
I've always been more into improvisation okay. and writing. So be, I think because of that, because I focused so much more on yeah. that, I'm not as good at learning other people's music. And so like, like I can do it, of course, yeah, yeah. you know, when I join a band and I learn the songs, but it's, it doesn't come as naturally to me as, you know, ma- making up my own stuff, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Make, makes sense. Makes sense. And, um, I was curious as far as your guitar collection, um, uh, do you have like a big uh, collection or what's your, uh, uh, or do you just have a couple? What's the setup as far as what you got? No, right oh, now? dude, it's, it's getting out of control. I mean, this <laughs> is a, it's a, it's, it's a great problem to have, yeah, yeah. right? When you run out of space yeah. for your guitars, but because I've been doing, because I've been doing these reviews yeah. and, and uh, I mean, <laughs> this is, I mean, it's, it's so funny to say this, but for years I was trying to find a way that I could justify buying more guitars, right? Yeah. And now, now I finally have it, right? Now I'm like, look, I've got to review the guitar, and then I put it on YouTube, and then you know I can make money off the video through advertising, so I can wow. I can justify spending the money on the guitar. Wow! I, I, uh, so I, for better or for worse, right? But I've yeah. got like, I, I've got over thirty right now. Oh well, that that's that's cool. And um, yeah, what what a problem exactly to have! What a sure. problem to have, you know and. I oh, yeah, there's a rare occasion where you, you also have people giving you guitars. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I'm I'm in heaven, man. <laughs> can't can't complain there. Now, um, you used to give lessons, didn't you, Max? Or uh, um, at one point? Yeah, for a while I was doing it on a pretty pretty regular basis. I still do it occasionally, uh-huh. but um, to be totally honest, my schedule is just so jam packed right now. I like. I kind of stopped yeah. taking on more students a while ago, <laughs> yeah, I hear you. and then you know here and there I've, I you know I had a few drop off because they just you know went on to other things or something. One guy actually got into uh, Berkeley College of Music. Uh, wow. Shout out to shout out to Mike Rudolph if he's listening. He's a fantastic player and he uh, has gone on to great things. But well, that's, but that's yeah, so I, I don't do quite as many lessons as I used to. Well, like I said, we'll, we'll wrap it up and get ready to go because I know it's getting late, but. Thanks for taking time to talk to me again, uh, Max. And um, the interview itself will probably be up within the next week or so. I'll let you know the minute it gets um, posted. At that point, you're, you're more than welcome to post on any of your sites if you wish to do so. And um, do me a favor. Um, obviously, we're going to keep in touch as we have over the years. But um, the minute you get ready to um, drop the Elon Musk thing, um, or rapid, rapid command rather, um, let me know. And um, I'd be happy to write up a review for the CD and um, do an interview specifically about that when the time is right. Oh yeah, that'd be great, man. And I'll, uh, you know, if you want, I can, I can send you a few, like some MP3s, like a few advanced tracks, yeah, just, just to check get it out, and, and yeah, so you can get a flavor, you know, get a taste of it. And, and um, it's been a while since I've talked to Fangs, and so since he's involved, maybe I could do an interview with him and some other guys as well. That'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, well, you, you, take, yeah, you take, you take care, Max, and thanks again. Um, it's always great talking to you. Absolutely, man. Likewise, thank okay, you. Bye, bye.